pense qu'on va commencer. Je vous souhaite un bon après-midi. My name is Will Straw. I am director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. And I would like to welcome you all to this year's Fulbright Lecture in the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue à notre conférence Fulbright de l'Institut d'études canadiennes. We are particularly delighted to have Dr. Michael Stamm deliver a lecture entitled From Forest to Newsstand, The Canadian Origins of the American Newspaper. Now, Dean Manfredi will tell you more about, is there something, is the sound strange or not? Okay. Um, we'll tell you more about the Fulbright Lecture in a moment, but first, we are hosting a large number of other lectures throughout the month of March. In fact, we're thinking of branding it as Miskapalooza. Um, tomorrow, Professor Bill Weiser, historian um, from the University of Saskatchewan, considered by many the leading historian of Saskatchewan, is going to deliver a lecture entitled A Tale of Two Futures, Saskatchewan in 1905 and 2005, which will be at 4 p.m. in the Faculty Club Gold Room. On March 21st, Noah Richler will deliver the annual Mallory Lecture. On March 25th, Dr. Claire Campbell, who is here, um, will deliver this term's Econ Lecture, um, and on March 27th, Professor Robert Leckie um, will um, be giving a talk at MIT. So for more information, we have lots of pamphlets at the uh, registration desk. You can check our website and so on. We will also be hosting a small half-day conference entitled, Does Bilingualism Have a Future? Commemorating the 50th anniversary of the launch of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and, Multi and Biculturalism on May 1st. Um, so um, there's lots um, to attend, but um, let's turn now to this uh, event, which I've been looking forward to ever since I first met um, Michael. But I'd first like to invite Christopher Manfredi, the Dean of the Faculty Arts, of Arts to say a few words on behalf of the faculty. Thank you very much, Will. It's always a pleasure for me to participate in an event uh, held by the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, where I spent uh, six, uh, six great years in the old house on, on Peel Street. And I'm particularly happy to welcome you here to the uh, Fulbright Lecture. The MISC has hosted Fulbright Lectures since 2006, and the Fulbright Scholars Program has helped in raising MISC's profile both locally as well as in the United States. The Fulbright Program offers the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada an annual visiting chair focused on public policy and fields of mutual interest to Canada and the United States in order to further the development of MISC's program and research. The major benefits that MISC realizes through the Fulbright Visiting Chair are the intellectual value of integrating a dedicated researcher into ongoing areas of scholarly pursuit, the increased public visibility the Institute gains by having noteworthy scholars addressing issues of current debate and importance, and the long-term benefit of ongoing academic ties with the United States in areas of mutual interest and concern, and Michael joins a a distinguished list of former Fulbright lecturers, including uh, U.S. Ambassador to Canada David Jacobson, Karen Kudrowski, Raymond Cox III, and Stephen Farnsworth, among, among others. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be able to be a part of this, to be able to listen to the lecture, and to take some time away from other things that are on my mind these days. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome Will back and uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dean Manfredi. I don't know if you know how Fulbright works, but basically there's a time of the year when I or people in other departments get a number of applications of people who are looking for uh, to be Fulbright fellows. And some of them, you know, look more or less interesting. When I saw Michael's, um, I jumped out of my uh, chair. I was going to say out of my pants, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> out of my chair and um, getting to know him over the last few months has been one of the great delights um, of this year, as well as getting to know his partner, Ani, who is um, there, um, a professor of um, political science. Um, so, just to say a bit about Michael's um, 
life and career. He's an associate professor in the Department of History and the School of Journalism at Michigan State University. And in fact, looking at this room, I see um, represented the two parts of Michael's interest, a number of communications scholars, professors, and students, a number of historians, as well as friends of MISC. Uh, Michael received his BA in English from the University of California, Berkeley, his MA and PhD in history from the University of Chicago, the McGill of the Midwest, as it's known. Um, his doctoral dissertation was awarded the Margaret A. Blanchard Doctoral Dissertation Prize for Best Dissertation in Journalism and Mass Communications by the American Journalism History. Historians Association in 2007, and the book based on this research is known to many of us, Sound Business, Newspapers, Radio, and the Politics of New Media, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2011. Broadly speaking, Michael's research focuses on two areas, the political economy of news and journalism, and the consideration of new media in historical perspective. And his articles on these subjects have appeared in the Historical Journal of Film, Radio, and Television, American Journalism, Religion, and American Culture. Michael is currently writing a book tentatively titled The Metropolitan Newspaper in a Global Economy, which traces the history of the 20th century newspaper as a product of industrial um, capitalism. Um, and I believe the paper today is related um, in part to that. Um, so I just ask you to invite me in extending a warm welcome to um, my, now I think I can say, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Stamm. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I wanted just to say a quick thanks before I get started uh, to Fulbright Canada for their generous support um, and to the MISC board for allowing me to be here this year uh, and to the staff for making it such a wonderful place to come every day. Uh, and particularly I'd like to thank Will for making it um, just such a uh, fun work environment, creating such a great environment. It's been the, the most intellectual, intellectually rewarding year I've had in the profession. I can't thank you enough for that, so thank you. Um, so the, the, this talk is based on a book that I'm writing right now, and it, it, in, the, in both I'm trying to connect two histories of the past century that aren't often understood to be related. One of these is the history of uh, the metropolitan newspaper in the United States, and the other is the evolution of the trade relationship between the United States and Canada. So to connect the two of these things involves doing uh, two things. It involves remembering what a newspaper was in the pre-digital age. I use the term industrial newspaper. Uh, and it involves rethinking North American trade after 1911. Uh, this is when recipro trade reciprocity between the United States and Canada failed. Um, to be realized, a significant individual commodity was made duty-free soon after, and that was newsprint. And that would provide a tremendous boost to uh, both Canadian paper manufacturers and to American newspaper publishers for the next century. And it would provide a powerful example for policymakers to invoke when promoting free trade agendas throughout the century. So the book and the, and the talk more generally are an attempt to balance uh, a history of the 20th century newspaper as a product of North American natural resources and trade, uh, with also with a specific focus on the Chicago Tribune and its publisher Robert McCormick pictured here. Um, the choice of this narrative focus is not arbitrary. Um, as I hope to show, uh, the paper and its publisher were central to this related international history. McCormick took over as the publisher in 1911, the year that reciprocity negotiations failed, um, and he would remain so until his death in 1956. His family had owned the paper since the 1850s but during his lifetime it became one of the highest circulating and most important daily newspapers in the United States. One of the lingering reminders of the paper's success is the Tribune's uh, neo-Gothic tower built on, uh, completed in 1925 and still a distinctive feature of the city's skyline to this day. If you walk down Michigan Avenue in Chicago, it's still one of the most noticeable buildings um, in the city. The Tribune Company's success under McCormick was due in no small degree um, because of a strategy of aggressive vertical integration, uh, including the control of raw material supplies of newsprint from Canada. This was an era in which newsprint supplies and prices could fluctuate dramatically, both due to market forces and due to rationing programs imposed during, during the two world wars. Uh, and the Tribune always ensured itself a stable and affordable supply of the single most important input to its business, and really to any newspaper. This is the largest line item in the production of a metropolitan newspaper of the early 20th century is its newsprint bill. So having access to newsprint uh, made the Tribune, helped the Tribune become arguably the leading voice of American conservatism and isolationism in the New Deal era. And it also enabled the company in 1919 to begin publishing the New York Daily News as a wholly owned subsidiary. The Daily News was the first tabloid newspaper in the United States, and it was for a time the highest circulating newspaper in the entire country. These are two of the most famous examples of the paper. These are known to many historians and, and people. Um, the, the one on the left is the Tribune's um, 
overly enthusiastic uh, proclamation that the Republican Thomas Dewey had defeated the Democrat uh, Harry Truman in 1948. The famous photo is Truman obviously holding that issue up. Uh, and the second is uh, the New York Daily News' 1928 photo of Ruth Snyder executed at Sing Sing Prison. Uh, it's a, it sold 1.5 million copies that day. It was the highest uh, selling news, daily newspaper at any point in history in the United States to that day. And it was taken by a photographer who smuggled a camera in on his ankle um, and then took the photo of Ms. Snyder. So both of these things are, are not only cultural, they're, t they're cultural touchstones. You often see them in journalism history textbooks, but if you look at them as material objects, their history traces back from the point of purchase at an American newsstand to a tree in a forest in Ontario, or more likely uh, in Quebec for the one uh, on the left. So much of this work that I'll be presenting today talks about that, and many of the photographs that I'll be showing are drawn from a major archival collection that is just open to researchers in the last couple of years, or it's in the process of opening uh, in Ottawa. Um, and I've been the first researcher to use them, and these, many of these photos are unpublished photos from that collection of Tribune Company activities on the North Shore uh, of Quebec and in Ontario. So as research that looks at, at both communications media and Canadian staple goods, this is obviously a project that follows quite firmly in the steps of Harold Innes, and it's a subject at hand that ties together um, the two major themes that run throughout the Innes corpus, and one of these is the political economy of staple commodities, and the other is uh, the history of communication. And you see this, this connection show up in some speculative form throughout his work in the 1930s, but by the time he was writing The Bias of Communication in 1951, pu which published in 51, he had arrived at the idea that there was something particularly important uh, about, the, about the relationship in the, in the connection between the relationship between the history of Canadian staples exploitation and the history of Canadian, and the history of communication. He was writing this as the subject of his presidential address to the American Economic Association in 1952. Um, he died and didn't survive to deliver it. It was published the following year, however, in the American Economic Review. And in it, you can see the outlines of some of the connections that Innes was making. Um, he, he, in, in the essay, he talks about the, the exploitation of, of staple raw materials, as he called them. And for him, the chronology was fish, fur, lumber, wheat, minerals, and pulp and paper. So in, he had started with the histories of fishery and the fur trade in his early work, and he was convinced that the political economy of his own era was defined by pulp and paper. And he had some good reasons for doing this. In the 1950s, pulp and paper production was Canada's leading industry and accounted for nearly half the value of all Canadian exports to the United States. Having access to Canadian newsprint, Innes believed, was an essential element to the rise of the mass circulation daily newspaper in the United States and was integral in tying the two nations together in a trade relationship defined by, a US, by U.S. exploitation of a significant Canadian natural resource, the forest. And I hope to pick up on some of these themes today um, in a very limited and modest way. This is a photo of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the spring log drive in Quebec. Um, and it represents the natural origin of those two papers I just showed you. Um, we often call newspapers now dead tree media. And what, 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 this is sort of a, a colloquialism that we often use now in the Oxford English Dictionary even. Um, it's a trope most usually to, mostly used to portray newspapers as these lifeless and static remnants of the past in an era of vibrant and participatory digital media. Um, but there is a literal truth hidden in this. And newspapers really are the products of felled trees. And, and a century ago, that's all they were. There was no practical way to deliver content to a mass and dispersed public on a daily basis without newsprint. Today, a newspaper, a newspaper is not only something that we access as text on print, but it's something that we access on these. We all found out about the Pope, for example. I don't think any of us found out about the new Pope, for example, by reading a printed newspaper, but we found out about, about it by reading the newspaper, right? But until well into the 20th century, it, and if you wanted to publish a newspaper, you needed a factory, and you needed a great deal of paper, and this was the, getting, getting adequate supplies of paper was a persistent problem for the newspaper business throughout the 19th and the 20th century. In the, until, until the middle of the 19th century, newsprint had been made from cloth rags. You could make a very clean and very good piece of paper out of cloth rags. The problem is there's only so many of them. And the penny press, as the penny press begins to rise in the 1830s, publishers need increasing amounts of paper, and they're increasingly anxious, anxious about the supply and the cost of the paper that they can get. So they found an alternative in 1839 when a German inventor figures out a way to make paper out of wood pulp. And over the, over the following decades, um, Paper makers increasingly switch over to making their paper not from rags, but from the more radically and plentifully available material of wood. Um, by 1880, the majority of paper makers had switched over to using wood to make their paper, and this dramatically expanded the amount of paper available, and it dramatically expanded the amount of information circulating publicly in printed newspapers. So in 1879, when the process of making wood-based paper had become more or less the dominant one in the industry, uh, North American newsprint manufacturers produced roughly 150,000 tons of newsprint in 1879. 25 years later, using, mostly, using almost exclusively wood, papermakers on the continent were producing almost 1 million tons of newsprint annually, and this rapidly increasing supply of paper helped to enable the era, for better or worse, of yellow journalism as defined by William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Uh, by the late 1940s, 
Newsprint mills in North America were producing roughly 5.5 million tons of newsprint annually, and Canadian manufacturers were prone to making such boastful but true claims that, quote, each day we make enough newsprint to cover a two-lane highway from Vancouver to Halifax. So in the 20th century, the daily newspaper was, was enabled by advances in the mass industrial production of newsprint. And this industrial aspect of newsprint is often forgotten today. Um, but it's important to remember that in making newspapers into the important institutions they were socially and politically, publishers adapted almost all of the strategies and tactics that any other manufacturer did uh, in their business. Newspapers became powerful institutions because of the owner's application of industrial technologies and the harnessing of raw materials. Publishers needed dead trees to feed the machines. So because of this incessant need for large supplies of newsprint, newspapers like the Tribune, like the Chicago Tribune, came to have an influence not only on society on, and politics, uh, but also on the, in the, on the environment and, and on North American trade. Many of the most available stands of trees in the early 20th century um, were, not, were not as well fit to, new, to make newsprint in the United States. So the Douglas fir of the American West and the pine of the American South had wood that was too dark to make desirable newsprint without a great deal of chemical processing. Um, in addition to the transportation costs associated with getting a very heavy and bulky commodity from the West Coast and the South to the Northeast and the, and the Great Lakes region where, where most of the metropolitan regions and major newspapers were located 100 years ago. Spruce proved to be ideal and the location to make, to make the newsprint and the location of it along and north of the U.S.-Canada border, especially along the Atlantic seaboard and the Great Lakes region, made the, made the tree particularly attractive and it made publishers begin to seek the raw materials for their newspapers increasingly north of the U.S.-Canada border and it increasingly began to draw U.S. Publishers, publishers into arrangement with Canadian paper mills. So what they, what they eventually did, what U.S. publishers eventually did was to produce an industrial commodity and the material history of this commodity is in some respects an interesting echo uh, of some of the arguments that Karl Marx offered in Capital, a book published in 1867 during this conversion from rag-based paper to wood-based paper. Capital is about a lot of things, but it's, at the core it's a study of the commodity. And the commodity, Marx says, hides what it is. He says it's at first, at first sight, quote, an extremely obvious, trivial thing. A commodity has a value expressed in money, and if I give you the appropriate amount of money for that commodity, I take possession of the commodity that I desire. And the simple exchange, however, elides the commodity's social and material history. And Marx tries to make his readers aware of the metaphysical subtleties that commodities have. When he first introduces this concept in Capital, under the concept of commodity fetishism, as he calls it. He starts with the example of a wooden table. And he says, it's absolutely queer, quote, clear, quote, that by his activity, man changes the form of the materials of nature in such a way as to make them useful to him. The form of wood, for instance, is altered if a table is made out of it. Made from wood by human labor, a table becomes a commodity exchanged for money, a, quote, thing which transcends sensuousness, as Marx put it, and the human labor and the raw materials are obscured in the transaction. The same is true of the printed newspaper. The difference is that it offers us something different than a place to put our lecture notes or our wine glasses after a lecture. Uh, it offers a daily vision of social and political reality for those who buy them. So in some respects, this is a project that traces the newspaper as, as an industrial commodity um, and its capitalist metamorphosis from the Canadian forest to the American newsstand. Um, and it starts, uh, as I'll talk about now, in Bay Como, Quebec. I'll talk a little bit more about Bay Como in a second, but I just want to show this visual. This was the Chicago Tribune's uh, paper mill up in Bay Como, Quebec. And, and one of the few advantages, if there are one, um, of having a pulp and paper company um, extract resources as opposed to, say, uh, a petroleum company is that there are uh, staff photographers in a newspaper to take nice <laughs> pictures of it. And so these are some of the photos uh, taken uh, of the operations uh, at the Tribune's mill uh, in Bay Como, Quebec. So they get the, they're, they're pulling the logs out of the forest into the mill. These are then made into paper, these massive paper rolls, which go into these mills that sort of, the, these warehouses that sort of look like the end of Indiana Jones. Uh, they're then put onto boats where they're taken to Chicago and you can see uh, this is the Chicago Tribune printing plant. You can see the Tribune Tower in the upper left of the frame and the paper being unloaded at the printing plant along the Chicago River. Uh, and then this is uh, being unloaded at the, the same reels being unloaded in New York at the New York Daily News plant. And what you get is this. So a tree might make a table, but it also might make things that shape our ideas about things about such as war and peace as these two uh, front, page, front pages from December 8th, 1941 demonstrate. And what this also means is that for almost 100 years now, the, the, uh, a few months short of 100 years now, we've had an integrated continental economy uh, in newsprint and that our local newspaper, the thing that is really, this, it has the name of our city in it, is a product of global industrial capitalism. So as purveyors of industrially produced commodities, U.S. publishers were in many respects similar to automakers. Both groups used factories, both wanted steady, predictable, and affordable supplies of essential raw materials, many of which could not be found readily or affordably in the United States, but which could be found elsewhere in the hemisphere. 
This motivated Henry Ford in the 1920s to try ultimately unsuccessfully to build a rubber plantation in the accompanying company town of Fordlandia on 2.5 million acres of government granted land on the Amazon River in central Brazil in order to make tires for his cars. And this is also what motivated Tribune publisher Robert McCormick to seek timber lands in Canada. And the aim was the same, control the production process as much as possible through vertical integration down to the most basic elements needed in production. Now the fact that McCormick even had the opportunity to go to Canada to do this had, a, had, a, had to do with a significant shift in thinking of, in state policy about the tariff from 1911 to 1913. So policymakers in the U.S. and Canada had uh, discussed trade reciprocity at various points, and they had operated under the Elgin Marcy Treaty, Elgin Marcy Treaty, a free trade pact from 1854 to 1866, the U and when the U.S. abrogated it. And free traders on both sides of the border in subsequent decades tried to, tried to get free trade and reciprocity reinstituted picks up momentum in the early 20th century. And by 1911, U.S. and Canadian policymakers had come to an agreement uh, about trade reciprocity that offered free trade in many natural products, and, uh, in, such as wheat and produce, as well as in manufactured newsprint. The U.S. Congress approved the pact. When it goes to the Canadian Parliament for approval, conservatives in Parliament mounted spirited opposition, uh, the outcome of which was that pro-reciprocity, uh, prompting, prompt, prompting the Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier to call an election, the outcome of which was that pro-reciprocity liberals were trounced at the polls, conservatives came into power, and reciprocity failed. And it would fail. This, would be, this was the big, the 1980s were seen by free traders as the big return to the failure of 1911 in Canada. Now, Canadian voters um, recoiled from reciprocity and, and its liberal proponents for a variety of reasons, not the least of which uh, was the fear of annexation by the United States, and this is a fear that is not as, was not as irrational in 1911 uh, as it is a century later. In 1911, the U.S. was in the middle of creating a global empire in the 13 years after the Spanish-American War. The U.S. had taken possession of colonies stretching across the Pacific to the Philippines. Uh, in the Western Hemisphere, that we were, the United States was organizing its few remaining territories in the Southwest into states. It had spread out into the Gulf of Mexico and in the Caribbean with Cuba with Puerto Rico. Under the Roosevelt Corollary was taking an increasingly aggressive stance toward Latin America, including perhaps most egregiously uh, the supporting of, of the creation of Panama and the construction of a canal through that. Um, this was an empire that was both uh, territorial and capitalist, to use geographer David Harvey's terms. Uh, so when Champ Clark, who was a, a Democratic member, and, and soon after making these statements, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, uh, made the intemperate and rather buffoonish remark in February 1911 that he, quote, looked forward to the time when the American flag will fly over every square foot of British North America up to the North Pole. Some Canadians took this literally. Rejecting reciprocity meant not only rejecting a trade relationship with the U.S., it meant rejecting being made a part of the U.S. Um, so reciprocity failed, Recipro which, which, you know, this is again free trade in natural products and finished manufactured newsprint. That fails in 1911. However, two years later, the U.S. Congress passes the Underwood Tariff, which removes the import duty on printed newsprint, and all of a sudden we have a continental economy in newsprint. And this in many ways had to do with aggressive lobbying on the part of publishers to Congress to get free trade in what was essentially the most significant uh, input to their business. The massive U.S. market is now open to Canadian production on newly advantageous terms and the center of North American newsprint production soon moves north of the U.S.-Canada border. Canada becomes the world's leading producer of newsprint, and by 1938, manufacturers in this country were producing more newsprint than their nearest four competitors combined, U.S., Britain, Germany, and Finland, and this is a position that Canada would retain for decades. The vast majority of, these, of, these, of this production goes directly south to the United States. So you get the failure of reciprocity in 1911, um, but you get the removal of the duty on newsprint in 1913, which provides an immediate boost to what becomes the leading industry in Canada and provides North U.S. publishers with essentially free trade in the most important element to their, newspaper, to their business, and it gives us an integrated continental economy in the most important constituent part of the newspaper business um, for now almost a century. And this is where the Chicago Tribune then becomes central to the story. So McCormick takes over, Robert McCormick takes over the paper in 1911, uh, and the, the city of Chicago is growing rapidly, and he's got, he's got big designs for the paper. Um, he's dismayed by the failure of reciprocity, but he's, he's gratified in 1913 uh, when newsprint is then made duty-free, and he, he thinks he's going to take advantage of this new duty-free status of newsprint. So what he immediately does is to build a mill on the Welland Canal at Thor on the river. So right in the middle of Chicago, it's the lower left uh, on the shore of Lake Michigan. Uh, of the frame. Um, this was situated both close to the affordable power offered by Niagara Falls and easy access from the waterways for both the, the trees coming out of the forest and then the finished paper which could then be taken along the Great Lakes uh, from Thorold, Ontario down to Chicago very cheaply and very affordably. So the Thorold Mill gave the Tribune a steady, access, a steady newsprint supply, and it allowed the, com the company to better rationalize its production and its operations, but the paper needs that it had were still greater 
than the mill's initial capacity, and it still had to, pre it still had to purchase some paper on the open market. So the company is also finding ways to become vertically integrated. It also faces additional challenges in needing paper when it starts the New York Daily News in 1919. Um, the demands of publishing these two papers uh, created an extraordinary need for paper. The internal estimates that the company made were that by 1940, it was using 672 million pounds of paper annually to print these two papers. The Daily News was the highest circulating paper in the country, the Tribune was second, and the two put together were using some 672 million pounds of newsprint, uh, about one-tenth of all of the production that was, that was done in the United, the consumption in the United States, and the vast majority of this came from Canada. So during this period, officials within the Tribune Company begin uh, scouting out additional timberlands to get the trees to put, into, to put into their thorough mill, and they begin to make a number of scouting trips around Ontario and Quebec. And this is publisher Robert McCormick uh, on the Manicouagan River on one of these scouting trips in 1923. So through negotiations with provincial poli with policymakers in Ontario, the company eventually obtained 1,800 square miles of timberlands uh, on several locations around the province, and these are the sort of the green blotches in the map. The largest of these uh, was at Heron Bay, which is situated on the north shore of Lake Superior, but they've got a couple other um, large timber limits uh, scattered throughout the province. Uh, in Quebec, the company obtained timber leases on the north shore and ultimately controlled uh, some 6,000 square miles of forest there. Uh, this is this large it's, about, it's not necessarily the largest parcel of land by the standards of Quebec geography, but it's about the size of the American state of Connecticut. Uh, the location of the Ontario leases uh, offered easy transport from the forest to the mill at Thorold, but having this large tract of forest in a location with convenient access to the Atlantic and, the New York, and, and to New York City motivated the Tribune to consider building a second mill in Quebec to complement its Thorold factory and more directly to supply the New York Daily News. Why should you take all of logs to Ontario first when some of the paper had to go to New York? You can bypass that journey in the Erie Canal simply by putting, them on the, Atlant putting the paper on the Atlantic Ocean and taking it down to New York City. So the area around Thorold had, so the Tribune is beginning to consider the, the possibility of developing something on that land and using that land for more than simply a place to cut down trees. Uh, the area around Thorold had been developed decades before the Tribune built its mill there in 1913, but the remoteness of the Quebec location also motivated the Tribune to become a regional planner. And this was a tantalizing opportunity for the publisher, for Robert McCormick in the 1930s, as exploiting the North Shore offered not only commercial advantages, but symbolic political advantages for a conservative publisher. In the United States, this is the year of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and Quebec offered McCormick a chance to show the world how much better the private sector could do regional and econom economic development than the public sector. See, McCormick hated the New Deal. He was probably the, the, one of the most single important uh, and most rabid anti-New Deal public figures in the United States during the 1930s. Uh, and he, with, he, with, the, with the platform he had as the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, he loved telling the public why he hated the New Deal, and he did that quite often. Um, Franklin Roosevelt's administration, Tribune editorials, editorials repeatedly and consistently claimed was transforming the country into a, quote, economic and political dictatorship. McCormick saw nefarious purposes everywhere in the New Deal, but his attitude about federal, splan federal planning and spending on public works elicited particularly shrill remarks. Uh, among these loathsome public work pro pro works programs was the TVA. It's one of the signature programs of the early New Deal. It's an extraordinary effort, extraordinary effort to use federal spending and authority to transform the re uh, entire region of a country. Uh, the basis was the construction of a series of hydroelectric dams along the Tennessee River, which at the time only had the Wilson Dam at Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and the subsequent use of this cheap power would then be used to develop the region and to develop industry there and to develop settlement there. It was a very a sort of backwards region uh, at the time. So the town of Norris, Tennessee became a particularly focused point of hatred for McCormick. It, it was a town that was needed, it was built by the New Deal. There's a series of these New Deal, New Deal towns you find scattered throughout America. Norris is one of the most prominent ones of them. It was the first construction project undertaken by the TVA. It was needed to house workers uh, who were building the Norris Dam. It was the first major project that the TVA had undertaken. But it was also something that was going to be used as a laboratory to show how New Deal, New Deal principles could be reflected in the built environment. They were going, it, was going to, it was going to show how social and economic justice could be encoded into a city built by the federal government as part of a regional economic development plan. The town was to be, it was to be integrated into its natural surroundings, uh, and housing and services were made to be provided to residents affordably and efficiently. It was built in 1933 and 1934, and it was, it was aimed at uh, being a concrete example of how, the, of how the federal government could improve Americans' material lives. Um, but this is not how McCormick saw it. Um, to him, the structuring of the lives and the citizens, uh, the, the lives of citizens in planned communities like Norris demonstrated that, as one of his editorials put it, quote, there is no longer room to doubt that the communism of Lenin and Stalin has taken root in the United States. Can anyone doubt that in the inaccessible mountains of Tennessee is being grown the germ culture that is intended to infect America? <laughs> 
like 15 years before McCarthy. Um, Created, 13, created and allegedly controlled by the federal government, the town of Norris came to symbolize everything that Robert McCorrick came to despise about the New Deal and programs like the TVA. And this is where we get back then to Bay Como. So it's somewhat ironic that while lambasting the TVA in editorials in 1937, the vocal anti-statist Robert McCormick is himself funding and building a well-planned town in Canada for workers at a new mill that's built, uh, built by the Tribune Company, uh, and it brings industrial development and hydroelectric power to a region that had almost none previously. Uh, this is uh, a photo of the construction of Bay Como. It's a, it's a rather remote location. There's very little industrial development at the time. It's about uh, 250 miles downriver from Quebec City, about 420 miles downriver from where we sit today. Uh, building Bay Como and exploiting the region involved the, involved the Tribune building private hydroelectric power uh, on, the, on the dams in the regions, uh, and, it, and the, its development as a whole in the 1930s represented the largest private undertaking in all of Canada since the Depression had started in 1929. And this is really, if Roosevelt was to have his, TV, has, was to have his TVA, McCormick wanted his as well. Uh, by 1940, the Tribune Company estimated that it had spent some $150 million on materials, wages, and taxes on its projects in Canada, or something on the order of $2 billion in contemporary dollars over the course of that decade. Uh, and it rarely, uh, it rarely avoided opportunities um, to uh, tout its success as a U.S.-owned private enterprise stimulating the Canadian economy economy. And these are some of the photos of the company. Again, this is the advantage of having a newspaper do this as opposed to some other sort of corporation. You begin to see the town uh, taking shape along the waterfront. Uh, construction of a, you know, they had to build everything. There's literally nothing there um, when they got up there. And then this is downtown Bay Como a decade after the town had been built. Um, Many visitors to Bay Como marveled at what they perceived as the quality and the efficiency of the planning, and almost as soon as it was built, it elicited wonder from some observers. A correspondent from the Montreal Gazette visited the town and was impressed, remarking that, quote, walking along the main street, one pass passes the brand new bank and the town hall and the church. There are women's dresses in the windows of the shops, the, ladies, the latest from Paris for the ladies of Como, and you can, go through a stroll, you can go for a stroll through the residential district, past neat little houses and fresh coats of paint. Amazing changes have taken place in a year. The wilderness has been tamed. By 1948, after roughly a decade in operation, the town was flourishing. The former wilderness now had, in addition to a new, a new newsprint mill and a robust housing stock, a full range of municipal, facil municipal facilities and private stores, and a number of civic, civic associations and religious organizations had started in the region. Um, at Bay Como's official 10th anniversary in 1948, the Financial Times noted that, quote, the old province of Quebec is reaping the benefits of the enormous expenditures of American capital, and the Francophone, Francophone paper La Patrie called the town a, quote, testimony to private industry. Though some praised Bay Como and the Tribune's role in developing it, uh, there were many who criticized this, however, both in terms of criticizing uh, American foreign and U.S. foreign investment in Canada and the accompanying environmental degradation that projects such as this caused. Um, opposition members of the Legislative Assembly of Quebec accused Premier Tachereau of cronyism with the Tribune Company, uh, one of them remarking that there, that there were, quote, two forces at work in the destruction of Quebec forests, the first being forest fires and the second the American interests. And these sorts of, these sorts of criticisms continued for decades after in Quebec. Back. By 1948, Harold Innes had begun writing about the pulp and paper industry, and he offered an assessment of newsprint production in Canada that was, for him, strikingly clear and polemical. And partially through the development of that industry, Innes said, quote, American imperialism has replaced and exploited British imperialism. And as a theorist of communication, as well as of staples exploitation, Innes believed that the increasing usage of this particular Canadian staple had unique consequences that fish and fur had not. Uh, increased supplies of newsprint, Innes argued, quote, accentuate an emphasis on sensational news. Succinctly put, world peace would be bad for the pulp and paper industry. And in one of the most direct attacks on the Tribune Company specifically, a citizens group on the North Shore wrote an open letter published in the paper La Cote Nord, assailing the company's power in the region. Everything is monopolized there, and the Tribune Company is master and god, and the company is the dictator. Despite the criticism, uh, Robert McCormick and the Tribune Company continued to aggressively develop the North Shore in the 1940s and the 1950s. As Innes had suggested, the absence of world peace was indeed good for the newspaper business and in the World War II era and the prosperous decades after. The Tribune and the Daily News needed uh, increasing amounts of ever increasing amounts of paper to meet ever increasing public demand for their, for their newspapers. Starting in 1944, Robert McCormick began pushing provincial officials to allow his company to build a new hydroelectric dam on the Manicouagan River in order to generate the necessary additional power to allow the mill to expand production. 
The construction for the dam began in 1948, uh, and when it was completed in 1942, um, the immodestly named McCormick Dam ultimately provided so much surplus generating capacity that the Dragoon Company began soliciting partners, uh, uh, partners from other companies around the world who would come to the North Shore and make use of that power. So the company, the company representatives go around the world trying to find companies who want to come to the north shore of Quebec to use this power that it has because the province won't allow it to sell the power. But they say, if you can get someone to come and use it, go nuts. And so the company representatives start seeking anyone who wants to come up there to use that power. They negotiate with some 40 companies around the world uh, in the early 50s. Uh, and in, the 19, in 1954, the company partners with British Aluminum Company, uh, which decided to build a $31 million aluminum smelter uh, in a town site right next to Bay Como. This is a company that had extensive bauxite deposits uh, on the British Gold Coast in the now present day Ghana in West Africa, and was looking for a place to smelt this bauxite. It's the raw material for aluminum. It was looking for a place to smelt the bauxite uh, into aluminum. It had, it had been considering building this smelter either in Norway or in Africa, uh, but economic and political factors uh, stood in the way. And there's, there's, a, there's a memo I found uh, in the archives where a Tribune Company executive reports on a meeting that he had with officials at British Aluminum. He writes back to his superiors uh, that, quote, they are reluctant to invest in low-cost power sites in Africa and Norway because of the political factors and the length of time to develop the power. They fear Africa because of the black man's ascendancy and the insecurity of any investment made there. Norway is socialistic and the interference of government is terrific, end quote. Um, conditions in Quebec seem more agreeable to the company and the combination of cheap hydroelectric power and an immediately pro-corporate provincial policy convinced British aluminum to come to the North Shore in 1956 where they built um, a massive aluminum smelter. And that's the smelter uh, sort of in the middle of the frame up there, and they built an accompanying town site uh, just downriver uh, from where the existing uh, plant was. Uh, British Aluminum's partnership with the Tribune Company created a jointly owned company called Canadian British Aluminum, or CBA, which thus brought aluminum production into a newspaper, into an American newspaper company's diversifying corporate structure and extending the scope uh, of its staples-based operations. Over the following four years, CBA spent an estimated $100 million on industrial development in the region, and its operations were given widespread acclaim in the business press. And one of the great ironies of this in the early 1960s uh, is that it takes place at a historical moment when there are many uh, Francophonic Quebecers who are becoming increasingly radicalized, drawn to anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist thinking, often through reading the works of people like Franz Fanon and Albert Mamie that have origins in North Africa. And at the same time, you have a situation where thousands of workers in the province are themselves participating in a global colonial economy involving the resources exploitation uh, of bauxite from West Africa brought to Quebec and then sold uh, on the open market, on the global market. And this is all a process initiated uh, by a U.S. publisher coming to Canada because he wants paper to print his newspaper back home. So as a way of, of getting toward a conclusion, um, I'd like to talk briefly about the, the idea of newspapers and communities. Um, among contemporary scholars, one of the most influential theorists uh, of the cultural functions of the newspaper in the last couple of decades has been the anthropologist Benedict Anderson, who argues that newspapers create what he calls imagined communities uh, of individual readers <coughs> excuse me, who understand themselves to be part of a larger whole through the daily act of reading. The newspaper reader is ever unsure of exactly what his or her fellows are doing on a given day, but still retains a, a sense of community with them through the daily act of reading news and information in a common language. There's a lot to be gained by thinking about newspapers in this way, and I think many of us probably have relationships with certain media outlets that, that do still approximate this. Our people, we are part of a group that reads a certain newspaper. Um, it does involve, however, thinking about a newspaper in a, in a particular way. It's important to remember that in, at, at, in the way that as newspapers are the foundations of communities of readers, they are also the products uh, of, of mass production, of industrial production, and one that requires raw materials for that production that are often gathered or were gathered in a global economy. In creating corporations to operate under the conditions of industrial capitalism <coughs> me. in the 20th century, publishers built not only communities of readers, but communities of workers. In Bay Como, the Chicago Tribune built not only a newsprint mill, it built <coughs> excuse me, schools, churches, hospitals, and houses. It's not in any sense an imagined community. It's an entirely real planned community. And it's one that in the course of several decades reshaped and one, one might even say devastated the natural landscape of a region of Quebec. Manufacturing an industrial newspaper involved uh, attracting workers and their families to come live uh, in this part of Quebec. Uh, 
later involved building a major hydroelectric dam to generate new power to bring new, even newer development to the region in the form of aluminum smelting. And in thinking about a newspaper as a foundation of community in this way, it becomes something that's much more terrestrially direct. And this is a, a sort of way of, a, a form of usage, a usage of this term community um, that was invoked uh, by Quebec Premier Jean Lesage visiting Bay Como in 1962 on the 25th anniversary uh, of the founding of the town. And, and Lesage came and he praised the Tribune Company for what it had done in the region. And he said, quote, a community which was no more than an unmarked and unnamed indentation on the shore of the St. Lawrence River 25 years ago now contributes as much as $75 million each year in industrial productivity to the province. Lesage saw an even brighter future ahead for the region and for the province. And at the same time, he also looked to the past, praising Robert McCormick for his initiative and his planning in the region. Quote, it would not be difficult to say that McCormick contributed to more than a town when he approved the plans for Bay Como. I think this town will remain for a long time as a living memorial to Robert McCormick. Besides the town itself, there remain in Bay Como and the area around it uh, two symbolic monuments uh, to Robert McCormick on the North Shore. One of these uh, is the hydroelectric dam uh, that bears his name. Um, and the second of these is a more curious sort of symbol. Uh, it's a statue of McCormick in the harbor uh, at Bay Como on the waterfront. It was dedicated in 1956 after his death. Uh, it's a monument to his arrival on the North Shore in the era of the scouting trips, uh, rather than a monument to the corporate reorganization of its space and the exploitation of its resources. Um, this was an, an executive who spent uh, much of his adult life um, in bedrooms and in mansions, uh, excuse me, um, corporate boardrooms and in mansions. It's <laughs> probably that too, right? <clears throat> Sorry. Boardrooms and mansions. <laughs> bedrooms as well. Uh, the statue that memorializes him in Bay Como, however, is uh, an 18-foot statue of him rowing a canoe. Um, there's an aerial photo of the of this memorial uh, that I think places the achievement uh, in greater The memorial is now in the lower right-hand corner of the frame. Um, in this image, uh, the, this, it's set off from the industrial activities that clash harshly from the natural landscape that his company had, had exploited and transformed over the series of a few decades. Um, Beyond the physical monuments, McCormick's lingering presence in Bay Como filtered out uh, in some other significant ways into policies that affected uh, all Canadians and all North Americans uh, later in the 20th century. The, co the company ultimately had effects not only on the environment and the economy of Bay Como and Quebec, uh, but also of Canada, as they would have significant influence on Brian Mulroney, who became the Prime Minister in 1984, signed the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement in 1988, and then negotiated the basis of the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1992 before leaving office. Um, Mulroney's father, on the left, Benedict, was an, elect was an electrician and was one of the first Tribune Company employees in Bay Como in 1937. This is a photo um, taken of him in 1957 that was hung on the mill wall. This is his 20th anniversary service photo um, that was hung on the wall of the mill office. Thirty years later, in 1987, uh, Brian Mulroney praised his hometown of Bay Como as a place that provided a vision for Canada's participation in the global economy. Uh, in Bay Como, Mulroney claimed, quote, we've always known the importance of international markets. We lived by them. We've always known the importance of foreign investment. We saw it in our jobs and in our very lives. In his 2007 memoir, uh, Mulroney attributed some of the think his thinking along these lines directly to the Chicago Tribune and to its publisher. Uh, Mulroney wrote that, Rob, that Tribune publisher Robert McCormick, quote, influenced every part of Bay Como life. Though derided today by many as some, as some sort of 20th century Republican robber baron, McCormick was in fact a larger than life figure who dreamed the great dreams necessary to carve a thriving community out of bedrock and forest on the North Shore while building a newspaper empire in the United States. And applying the lessons, uh, some of the lessons that he learned from one of America's foremost newspaper publishers, Mulroney, would then help to reshape uh, the histories of North American trade and Canada's role in the global economy. One needs to be careful in, in assessing statements like Mulroney's. I'm, I'm not quoting them to practice armchair psychology or to, over, to you know, make the case that Mulroney's childhood is the key to understanding North American trade. Um, instead, it's to point out the rhetorical use of Bay Como and developments like that in Canadian politics to sell these sorts of things, to sell the beneficence of American corporations to citizens and voters who are often skeptical of these sorts of things. And this had been the case in Bay Como for decades. Um, throughout Bay Como's planning and development, McCormick and his executives uh, had been very friendly uh, with, with uh, Premier Tachereau. Um, they developed very cordial relationships then uh, as, as Bay Como's construction drew closer to Maurice Duplessis, uh, pictured here. 
Duplessis was uh, the, the Quebec Premier who ruled the province, I, I think, with a, a degree um, of centralized authority that was far greater than any of the, the most caricatured New Deal autocrats that McCormick um, skewered in his pages in the States. And McCormick and Duplessis never, I, as far as I can tell, were never close personal friends, uh, but they did develop a warm uh, working relationship. They shared a staunch anti-communism, and each used the other to his advantage. McCormick got his industrial development, and Duplessis was able to consistently tout it as an example of how public-private partnerships between his province and American corporations worked to Quebec's benefit. This was uh, as, at a speech in Bay Como at the, at the opening uh, of the CBA smelter in 1958. Uh, Duplessis denounced critics of American corporations while touting their contributions to Quebec. The extremists speak against foreign investment, Duplessis claimed, while, quote, the province of Quebec believes that American capital is doing good in the province of Quebec. Now, the question of whether American investment in Quebec or in Canada has been good, I think, is something that remains open. Um, and I think there are many who would, who would disagree with Duplessis. But American corporations and American capital uh, certainly were doing something in Quebec. And perhaps the best way to understand what the Dubune Company was doing in Quebec was through, through two pairs of photos. Um, the first of these, uh, taken in April of 1937, shows the outline of the construction of what would become uh, the paper mill uh, in the spring when they were beginning the construction of the mill. The second, taken in October from, I guess, about the same vantage point, uh, shows workers dwarfed by the size of machine, the machinery that went into that building that was constructed. So you get in the first image the outline of a newsprint mill sketched into the cleared land of what had just recently been a forest. Uh, and the second shows an industrial interior and an industrial mode of labor that are entirely new to the region. And then in the second pair, one can see the transformation of the landscape around Baycoma, one taken uh, in 1931. Um, and then the second taken uh, in 1962. Uh, from, the air, the town, from the air, the town looks as well planned as any New Deal town, with its, curve, with its curvilinear streets harmonizing with the landscape. The mill area clearly defined, four um, neat piles of logs stacked behind the mill awaiting industrial processing. Uh, over the course of several decades, the Tribune Company imprinted itself upon the landscape of Quebec to obtain the materials it needed to print newspapers in Chicago and in New York and to establish itself as one of the most important media corporations in the hemisphere. Uh, this is the American newspaper operating as an industrial concern in a global economy, uh, and this is the Canadian origins of the American newspaper. Thank you. Thank you. I now invite you to ask questions, make comments. Um, we have someone who will come around with a microphone. I would ask you to identify yourself before um, intervening. And uh, I think we'll begin with the woman here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nadia Alexan. Is this, is this on? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, my name is Nadia Alexan. I'm uh, the uh, founder of Citizens in Action. And I disagree completely with what you have said. First of all, Duplessis was giving away our forests and our resources for free. The companies that you say did good for the people, you did not speak about the pollution, you did not speak about the pittance they were giving to workers, you did not speak about uh, what kind of benefits, what kind of um, uh, protections they had when they died in those uh, factories. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the problem now with uh, newspapers, and you said it yourself, is that the concentration of of papers, newspapers, in the hands of one or two moguls who are always preaching their own brand of, uh, of uh, ideology, and it's always against the people, and um, there, there are different, the, you don't speak about the pollution that, uh, and the destruction of, the, uh, of nature uh, with those dams and, those, uh, uh, and, and, and this machinery. Um, I, I, and right now it's the concentration of uh, newspapers in the hands of one or two moguls that is the problem in Canada. More than anywhere else in the world we have this problem. Of, and, and it's an affront to democracy because when you have the, the voices of one or two people um, and, and the rest of, of the people have no voice, then this is not a democracy at all. And free trade was good, yes, for business, but it was not good for the majority of Canadians. No, I, think, I, I think maybe we misunderstand. I, I, I am very critical of this corporation. I mean, I thought I was attempting to point out the latent hypocrisy 
in the fact that you have a, uh, one of the great, one of the most vociferous critics of the New Deal, one of the most vociferous critics of one of the most significant attempts to create social and economic justice in the United States. Ironically, I, maybe I, 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 the, the, what, I, what I actually maybe think it is is, hip, is hip, hypocritically. I mean, I was trying to point out the latent hypocrisy in what he was doing, not celebrating. No, 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 I, I, no, no, I didn't, I, I think maybe, maybe, no, that, that isn't what I said. I, I said there is an idea that Duplessis was putting out to the public that business was good, and I think many would disagree with that. And I, I think in many respects I would put myself into that category. I'm not trying to celebrate at all what this company did to the environment or to the workers of Canada. I think what I was trying to do was point out how hypocritical it was that you have this, this man in the United States criticizing the exact thing that he is doing in Canada with the, and the only reason he can do it is because of state policy about the tariff. So you have an anti-statist taking advantage of state policy, giving him free newsprint, and then coming to Canada to then do that. So I, I, I don't, I, I think we actually probably agree with each other. I wasn't trying to at all celebrate what was done here in sort of in, in environmental terms or in economic terms. I, I'm in fact very critical of these. I was trying to point out how hypocritical, in fact, this, this company was. So. But yeah, I think we probably agree with each other about much of what you said. I know, Michael, you agree more than uh, <laughs> Other qu comments or questions? Yes. Uh, I'm Bill Buxton, uh, Concordia University. Uh, you talked about the American ownership of newsprint plants in Canada. Um, to what extent was this an issue in terms of American ownership as opposed to Canadian ownership? To what extent was there Canadian ownership in the newsprint industry within Canada or within the pulp industry? For instance, uh, Abbott to be Price, what was its ownership structure? Or was it just rampant Americanism in which they basically just did what they wanted without any limits in terms of, of buying land and property for their own uses? The, the largest producer was the International Paper Company, which is a multinational concern that had started in the United States. But there was significant Canadian production. The Abitibi Corporation, um, later the Consolidated Pulp and Paper Company, um, Spruce Falls Pulp and Paper, which was 50% owned in Canada and 49% owned by the New York Times. But there was a significant um, domestic ownership of the industry in Canada. But there also, I, I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but I do know that the largest by far, paper mill, paper company was international paper, which was a multinational concern that operated um, on both sides of the border. But there was significant ownership by Canadian corporations of these um, of these corporations. Uh, Elspeth Heeman in history. Uh, I just want to say that was fabulous paper, yeah. really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, what about the, I wondered about the, uh, the profile of Bay Como in American newspapers, uh, mm -hmm. allied, rival, critical. I wonder if there was a genuine interest in the little company town that could, or mm -hmm. you know, how that played out. There was a pretty significant amount of coverage <clears throat> of the paper, uh, of, the, of the town in the Tribune and in the Daily News during McCormick's lifetime. Um, he loved to sort of demonstrate his technological might by showing um, the production of his paper, the production of, of you know, the sort of, there are all these, these, they would run these articles periodically, these well-illustrated articles called like From Trees to Tribunes or something like that, where they would, or they, or they would have these sort of like prosaic accounts of what was going on, you know, in, in, the, woods, in the woods origins of the paper. But I think to your point, they, they would always elide the real political economic conditions in the country and the environmental costs. They would, they would cover it to the extent of showing you know, look what we can do to nature to bring you the Tribune. Um, and these things slowed, they, they, these things slowed quite a bit. I, I think this seemed less impressive, perhaps after, you know, television and cable television to sort of demonstrate what you could do to trees to make newspaper. This, but, um, but in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, uh, in the pages of the Tribune, there was quite a significant uh, amount of coverage um, of Bay Como. Thank you. Uh, Darren Barney from Communication Studies, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit of, uh, of a question about this community business that you mm -hmm. ended your, your talk with. I think it was really great the way in which you showed how, in this case, the newspaper made a community that wasn't at all imagined or mm -hmm. tied to the kind of shared uh, experience of its content, but really was about its material plant. Mm -hmm. um, along those lines, I mean, the other thing that you demonstrated in the talk is that Bay Como was linked by networks of commodity movement and in supply chains mm -hmm. and movement of capital and goods that, 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 that kind of made it a community that was part of a, a kind of transnational network yes, yes. Uh, from a very early stage. And I'm wondering if, 
if you have any evidence of or could talk a little bit about ways in which that lended a kind of political cultural specificity to Bay Como relative either to the rest of Quebec mm -hmm. or the rest of Canada. You alluded to it a little bit talking about Brian Mulroney and his, yes, you know, yes, how yes. this made him favorable to uh, free trade. But I'm thinking about beyond that. Is there mm -hmm. something special about Bay Como that arises from its situation as part of this kind of transnational network that arose from the way in which its economy was uh, structured? Yes, I think perhaps the main way was the, the predominance of Anglophones in a part of Quebec that you would not have expected to find them. Um, one of the things that the Tribune did as part of this attempt to, to really demonstrate how, how well it could do as a private regional developer was it, it actually wanted to show that it could build a town that had harmonious relations between Anglophones and Francophones and Catholics and Protestants. So when it was encouraging settlement, it would send out these flyers printed in English on one side and French on the other side to try to attract a, a bilingual and, and, and bi-religious um, workforce to the province, and they were always talking about this. I mean, Mulroney would talk about this in speeches. He would say, you know, this is a place where hard work, you, you know, you got what you got through hard work and everybody got along, and it was sort of, again, a little bit prosaic, but there was a kind of multilingual and multicultural aspect to it. Um, it's probably a little bit like the way Duluth, Minnesota is, being an international port uh, on Lake Superior, that you, you go to this kind of place that's very remote um, from the rest of the world, it seems like, and you find a kind of culture there that you would not find to this day. And from what I gather, I, I'm hoping to visit uh, in the spring after the thaw happens, but from what I gather, there is still a pretty significant Anglophonic population in Bay Como in the area immediately around it, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that the initial settlement was made to be, um, if not global, at least sort of multicultural or multilingual in a way, um, in that sense. But I, I don't know how, but I hope that answers the question. There's a gentleman here, the Yes, thanks for your talk. You. Uh, Brian Mulroney uh, worked for Iron Ore Company after. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is 50 years ago sort of thing mm -hmm. you're seeing. Um, and uh, Duplessis uh, did, did roughly the same thing. Uh, as we, we think of giving it away. Mm -hmm. they, he, they promised to uh, U.S. Steel. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're going to charge them a, a royalty of one cent a ton of iron ore, mm -hmm. which was absolutely nothing. But, but they promised them, because they're charging them, oh, we're going to give you cheap labor mm -hmm. for one cent a ton. You see, you have to appease the Americans because they're going to pay some. Yeah. So it was a kind of a, th did we take full advantage, I, I'm not speaking as a Canadian, of course, and I'm a mining guy, uh, and uh, uh, did we, did we, do we get our, our fair share? That's what I want to know. Did the Canadians? Yeah, we, the Canadians, well, we got jobs, we got cheap labor, but did we get a fair, sh fair deal? I mean, free trade, as a result of free trade in the pulp and paper industry, it was very volatile, eh? And as you know, yeah. that was a bi the pulp and paper industry was with the biggest success story in the, wor in, in mm -hmm. the world as far as that business was concerned mm -hmm. over the years. Now, right now, it's dead for the last 20 years. Yeah. But yeah. it was very successful for the shareholders. Yes, yes, yes. Um, no, quite frankly, I, I don't think that Canadians got their fair share out of this. I mean, I think that in many ways, these were, the, the, the deals were always very favorable to American corporations. Um, and they were, they were negotiated that week. I mean, it's... it's he decided it was one cent a time. He decided himself. Like a, like a dictator. Yeah, well, it, I mean, the Americans had the capital. I mean, that was the sort of... I mean, that was... It was a power game, I think. At the end of the day, the, these U.S. corporations had... Canada had resources that Americans wanted, and the Americans said, we have the capital, we will come there and build the factory. Um, and I, but no, I don't... I, I think at the end of the day... But, you know, in a place like Bay Coma, there was always an understanding that this was something that was done for the benefit, benefit of the Americans. It was, a, it was understood in the town, for example, that all of the executives that worked in the town were Anglophones and the people who worked in the mill... Um, right now they're spending half a billion dollars in Bay Coma for the iron ore business to haul the iron ore to China. Mm -hmm. so it's, yeah. It's yeah, I think, I think these corporations went there not because they had a particular desire to invest in Canada. They wanted the resource, and the resource was in Canada, and state policy helped grease the skids for them to get to Canada to get the resource. Yeah. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, actually, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of echoes in eastern Canada. Obviously, mm -hmm. the Port Hawkesbury Mill in Nova Scotia has yeah. been the big question, and, uh, you know, Cape Breton was one of the most multicultural regions mm -hmm. in the country around the turn of the century because, and even though it's remote, it was, you know, the, the major industrial work site. But I'm just I'm thinking about the the really stunning contradiction between the the memorial mm -hmm. to McCormick and the memorial to McCormick, right? Mm -hmm. And how how the town 
I mean, again, the, the sort of the wonderful, de the wonderful denial of all the rhetoric and development of industrial progress mm -hmm. by romanticizing that sort of foray into the wilderness, yes. which presumably McCormick both had nostalgia for, but was very intent on eliminating, you know, mm -hmm. for, for the yes. methods of prof for profit. So I'm just wondering, I mean, was there any reaction to the town in this, this contradiction or how it's, how it's sort of registered with you as a historian? You mean in the sense of did people in the town understand McCormick to be sort of... A, um, well, I guess, you know, you're, you're going into work when the whistle blows oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you're looking at this guy who's yes, sort yes. of out there in his canoe and you're... You know, yeah, and yeah. you're sort of wondering yeah. how exactly that's supposed to explain the landscape around you. Well, one can imagine that there is there was a fairly jaundiced view taken by many, but there were also many who really did, I think, believe that um, you know the town was built uh, at the depths of the depression. It was built in 1937, and there were people who um, would take any work they could get, and there were people who still lived in the town whose whose parents and whose grandparents had gone up there for that sort of work. And so there was, uh, for some, a sense of there was a genuine sense of being glad that there was some sort of job there. But yes, I think there was also, um, I, I, I don't have any direct evidence of this. Um, I'm actually hoping to get into the, there are file, grievance files from the employees in Baycomo that I was not allowed into the first time around, in which I have gotten permission to get into the second time. Um, and I want to find out what happened in those. I mean, I want to find out what happened to the guy who, you know, got his hand cut off or something like that, or find out about the people who tried to negotiate for better wages in the town. And the, I think these are in files that, I'll, that I'm hoping to look at this summer. But it, the town was just a monument to the guy. It's McCormick High School. The, the, the Catholic Church is named after his dead first wife. Um, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, for how much the guy talked about dictatorship and Franklin Roosevelt, I mean, you go to this town and it's just McCormick. There's more McCormick stuff in Bay Como than there is in Chicago. So. Um, hi, Michael. Hi. Uh, great talk. Thank I really you. enjoyed it. And actually, your, the photograph that you showed um, of uh, Jean Lesage having just given a talk mm -hmm. or a lecture at my class this morning on Quebec history and about the Quiet Revolution mm -hmm. and, and their uh, opposition, at least ideologically, uh, to U.S. Uh, business. Mm -hmm. And then there I see a, a photograph with Jean Lesage, yes. you know, riding that little truck with McCormick his by his side. Moment. So did that not clash? I mean, what kind of, did that not re generate a reaction on behalf of uh, people? I, I would, yeah, anyway. It's a great question and one that I actually have on a list of things to follow up on, like <laughs> investigate quiet revolution. Um, there were people at that, I mean, Pierre Valliere did not specifically mention the Chicago Tribune Company, but he did specifically mention in his book, what the, his, his antipathy, he did discuss his antipathy towards the pulp and paper companies and what they were doing. And I, th I believe that book was published in 1964, 67? It's right in that era. And, and so there, was, um, there, was, there, there were contemporary voices that I know that were critical uh, of Lesage era politics towards places like Bay Como. Um, but it's a great question. It, like, that's actually one of the things on the list of like, need to go investigate this. Because it is sort of, Contradictory, right? That you have this guy going up there and putting a hard hat on, and you know, you know, cruising around in a bulldozer, and then saying very different things when he comes to the metropole about foreign investment and about politics, and then going up there and saying these sorts of things. Um, it, I, I don't know the answer to that. It's a great question. Okay, perhaps one final question here. Thanks, Blair Rourke. I'm a retired economist. Um, you hear stories about the company towns controlling everything, like mm -hmm. the commerce and all that type yes, of thing, yes, the yes. stores and all that time. Did, did uh, McCormick and his the Chicago Tribune control the commerce and other activities in the town or not? Great. No, and it was specifically by design. Um, the great, the, the counter examples that he had available to him for what a company town looked like when it didn't work were right in Chicago. There was Pullman, uh, which is right at the edge of the Chicago city limits, uh, built in the 1890s by a railroad car magnate. There, was, there were massive riots in Pullman in 1893 um, over people who got tired of the discipline imposed by the factory bell and then having to go to the company store. And the other example was Gary, Indiana, which is right next to Chicago, developed by U.S. Steel with no real plan or no real um, attempt to, to create any sort of infrastructure for, for the better, the social lives of workers. Um, so when they went up there, they, they specifically, and they, they have all this in the, in the, the internal corporate memos, they wanted um, what they called an open town. They didn't want um, workers to believe that they were, bought, they were shopping in the company store. They really wanted to encourage um, private development. And again, I think they really, there really was an attempt to use this town as a laboratory 
for private development. This really was an effort to show the private sector can do this so much better than what's done in the public sector. And they very much by design, housing was meant to be stuff that the worker, the houses were sold to workers. They were not company, they were built by the company, by, by a subsidiary company, and then sold to workers who then paid mortgages and then eventually owned the homes. Businesses were all done, were all privately owned. And this was very much by design so that they could tout this as, look how great this town works. You know, just let private industry go nuts. We can have a whole host of big homos all over the place. Okay, well, one of the wonderful things is that Michael um, is going to be around for still a few more months, so I'll continue to learn about Canada from um, someone from our neighbor to the south. Um, I'll ask you in a second to join me in thanking Michael again, but I'd like to present you with this. I realize it's a dead tree medium, but it's a, um, <laughs> a token of our um, appreciation. So thank you very much, and before I say that, I'll invite you to... Um, join us outside for a glass of wine, and I'll say what I've been saying the last few times. Don't run up and crowd Michael with questions and comments. Let him get to the wine, um, and I'm sure I'll be happy around to stand around and talk to you then. So thank you very much, Michael, for this wonderful talk.